Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your glory in this place. Thank you for your love for us. You are the ultimate Father. And so we thank you that, Father, you not only dwell in us, but, Father, when we come to gather together, you're dwelling among us. And so we yield ourselves to you for whatever you'll say, whatever you want to do. Have your way in this place, Holy Spirit. You know this is your domain here. Do what you want to do. I thank you for people being set free today, Father. Deliverance will take place, and your love will manifest in the lives of your people. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. All right. Now, I'm a, I'm a, I, I normally, when I get up, I have my Bible. So I'm going to do it from the iPad today. All right, we're going to see how that's going to work out. Amen. But just in case technology fails me, I got my Bible. Amen. <laughs> do me a favor. Um, but here's what we're going to do. I, I've got a, a, a few scriptures I'm going to share. Uh, and so what I did, I, I gave the media team uh, all the scriptures, and they'll be on the screen. Man, give a hand clap Mr. Tracy and all those guys back there. They do a great job. Thank you, sir. And so uh, I'm going to jump through a few versions, so don't worry about it. My version is a little different than yours. We're going to get to the same place when we finish, all right? But I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 28. <clears throat> Genesis 28. And I need some help from somebody on the front row. All right, Miss Carmen, you got, you got a pinky? You write something down on Miss Dick and Phyllis? Okay. All right, here's what I need to do. While you all are finding Genesis chapter 28, I want to I wanna hear, give me at least five characteristics of what you think a father is. Give me one. Let me go over there. I'll go one, two, three, four, five. All right, we've got different sections. Give me one from over here. Well, wow. well, my provider. Okay, okay. Well, uh, let's say provider. Let's say provider. A male figure. That's what you're saying. Something else. Protector. Okay. You got that, Carmen? Sean's writing it. Some, 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 somebody write it. Somebody write it. It's gonna be important late. I need y'all help me. All right. Give me some over here. Strong. Strong. I'm gonna take strong. Over here. Don't, y'all don't have nothing? Protector. Somebody said protector. A leader. A leader. All right. Somebody over here? Integrity. Integrity. I'll take that. Reliable. Somebody over here? Reliable. Reliable. All right. I'll take that. Y'all got it? All right. That'll be important a little bit later we go on. Okay. You guys heard what they are? Okay. And some of y'all didn't say nothing. Say, I, don't, I don't even know. We're going to handle that today. Amen. Amen. All right. Genesis 28. You there? Yes. Okay. All right. Genesis is a message Bible. I'll start in verse 16. It says, Jacob woke up from his sleep. He said, God is in this place. Truly. And I didn't even know it. He was terrified. He whispered in awe. Incredible. Wonderful. Holy. This is God's house. This is the gate of heaven. And I, I love this particular scripture. And I shared it last week with the men. Uh, because sometimes we can find that God is in the place, and I've been here in my life, God's been somewhere, and I didn't even recognize that he was in, in the place. We recognize sometimes, I mean, you see here in worship sometimes, we'll get here and there'll be a, a heavy presence of the Lord in the place, and then, you know, some folks on one side of the room are just getting ministered to, they're receiving from God, and then somebody else in the same section or the other side of the room, they're, they're, they're off, they might be on social media, they're not paying attention, and so sometimes that's how, that's how smooth God is, you know. He can still be in the place and do what he got to do, and you might not even know he's in the room. Amen. And, 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 and I found in my own personal life that as I go back and I look back at my life, that there have been times God has been there, and I didn't even recognize that he was in the place. Amen. Amen. So I, I want to lead us somewhere today. Now, I know that we're a church that teaches, and you're used to getting a title. But bear with me. I'll give you the title. In a little while. I'm going to just kind of walk us through something. Can y'all, can y'all hang with me? Because yeah. I know you're taking notes. You know, everybody wants to title that page. This is what he's teaching on. This is the lesson today. Let's just get an impartation. Is that all right? Amen. I'll drop it on you a little bit later, okay? Amen. All right, do me a favor. I'm, I'm, I need to lay up who I, what I'm going to do and what, who I'm, what I'm going to be today, all right? Second Timothy. Go to Second Timothy. Amen. Now, if you guys don't have it, just so we can roll, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to read it. Second Timothy chapter 3, yeah. verse, yeah, thank you for the A again, yeah. 310. <laughs> And this is uh, the Apostle Paul writing to his spiritual son. He says, For thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, 
long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, with what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. And here's what he's telling his son. He says, not all of you know my doctrine. You've known, you know, the scriptures and things. I mean, you know that. He says, but you've known my manner of life. You've, you've watched how I've done what I've done, and I've given you something. So you didn't just get me preaching a, a, a teaching to you, because I don't believe that anybody that stands up before you should just be preaching. A, you know, it's time to have a Bible lesson, but the best thing is when you get something off of somebody's life. You know, the Bible says that, you know, uh, study to show yourself approved. It didn't say study to, to preach a lesson. And so, and so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you me. Amen. All right? Amen. Not that you don't get me every time I stand up in this pulpit. Because I guarantee you, you probably could tell a skiing story. The dog chasing your story. The, the Dominique being lost at Disney World story. The every story that, I mean, some of y'all, and some people come back and they'll tell me all the stories. My God, when you fell in the skiing thing, oh my God, oh John. They don't even know the scriptures. They just know, <laughs> you know, what happened to me. Amen. So today, I'm going I'm to give you me, all right? Amen. And so it'll be a little more in, involved, all right? So I'm going to give you my story and just some things that God walked me through. And my prayer is that not only the dads will get something, that everybody will get something, okay? Amen. All right. Y'all ready to take this journey? Yes, sir. All attentions to the screen. Uh, media, you guys ready? All right. First, I'm going to show you a slideshow, and I'm going to narrate this, all right? Uh, <laughs> Miss Ivy already laughing, all right? She's already laughing. They, they've got it. Okay. That is Elder John's mommy. That's Miss Ruth. Amen. Yes. Y'all see, that's my mommy. Amen. Now, now if, if there's something misspelled, it's not their fault. I did the PowerPoint. All right. So forgive, forgive me. That's my mama. My mama, if y'all have been here uh, sometime, you know Miss Ruth. And Miss Ruth didn't play. Okay. I can guarantee you she in heaven Probably, if, you know, because we, we still got to get our minds when we get to heaven. And somebody's up, pick, pick that up. You know this is God's. She probably telling people what to do right now in heaven. Amen. Amen. And so that's my mama. Mama was born in South Carolina at five years old. She was uh, moved to New York City. And uh, she uh, was raised by my grandmother, had several brothers and sisters. And uh, my, her older brother passed away in a car accident. Uh, when she was in her early 20s, so she became almost under my grandma the boss of the family. Okay, so how many of y'all got mamas like that? That you know, they the matriarch. All right, next slide. That is El that's Elder John's daddy. Don't he look happy? <laughs> now, <laughs> the reason I put the emoji over his face is to protect the innocent. Okay, because there's some things I'm gonna say today. It's not gonna be real bad, but I don't, you know, I feel like I won't put him out there. And you know, y'all look at him and go, I know him. And then I want nobody else to run up on me. That's my daddy too. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I don't know how that's gonna play out. So so we can be safe. I figured I would go ahead and so you don't see his face and you're like, you know, we related. I, I don't want to hear that. Let me get let me get settled in some things before you tell me that's your daddy too. All right, that's Mr. Clarence. Amen. And, 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 and my mama, she loved her some Mr. Clarence. And Mr. Clarence, apparently he loved my mama, amen. That's a, next slide, please. That's my mommy and daddy on a dinner boat cruise. He's still happy, ain't he? Amen. <laughs> Enjoying the night out on the town. I'm not sure that my mama had gone out on nice places, but my daddy took her out on some very nice places and did some nice things with her. Next slide. That's my mama and daddy at Bear Mountain. I look at her. Look at my mama legs, man. <laughs> just, just, and that blanket, I, I was looking at the picture, I'm like, I remember that blanket, you know? And so they all Bear Mountain enjoying themselves, having a good time. And uh, I, I guess nine months later, next slide, there's baby John. <laughs> Not sure what happened on Bear Mountain, but <laughs> evidently something happened. And, there's baby John, that is me. We couldn't afford color at the time, so I was born in black and white. <laughs> Next slide, please. That's baby John enjoying his life. Yes, yes, yes. Baby John sold bean pies. He was a Muslim. No, I wasn't a Muslim, I'm just kidding. 
I saw how my mama put me in ties. So uh, Baby John was enjoying his life until, next slide please, Baby Doris showed up. <laughs> That's Baby Doris on the front row right here. I'm kidding, ain't she cute? All pink and stuff and hands all up in her face. Look at her, look at her, man. Hey, man. Next slide, please. Baby Darice was extremely adorable. You hear me? Just, just like a doll baby. But, next slide. She was always stealing mommy and daddy's attention from baby John. And y'all see me back there with the, the pajamas with the feet in them? Looking like I'm... That when you got too big, they ain't get you no pajamas, they just cut the feet out and you gonna you wear them. Y'all remember that? <laughs> I ain't getting no new pajamas, just my mama took them scissors and you gonna, you, you gonna wear them, hey amen? One thing my, my wife noticed is in the, in the left part of this picture is that I ain't had no toys. And so <laughs> all them toys was for baby Doris. I got toys, trust me. Next slide. We was a happy family. Can you see us? Look at us. At my grandma's house, that's why I guess she took the plastic off the couch at that time. And how many of y'all had to go to grandma's house and if you went through another room, you walked by them, them plastic beads, passed the picture of Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy with the big wooden spoon on the, floor, on the, on the, on the wall and the gold plate with the Last Supper engraved in it, passed the floor model stereo, with your baby picture with the bronze baby shoes. How many of y'all had that? See, some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but trust me, every grandma's house had that, you know? So we was a happy family, but, next slide, mommy decided to move us to Maryland without daddy, as you can see. Yes, we don't have daddy with us anymore, amen? Next slide, please. Well, we would come back to New York to visit. Unfortunately, Daddy never came to Maryland to live with us or even to visit us. I bet you're wondering where John is in this picture. Next slide. He was auditioning for the R&B group. <laughs> ready for the world. <laughs> uh, yes. I had an audition that day for Ready for the World. I didn't make it past the brew. So I went down to Harlem and auditioned for Full Force and The Deal, and I didn't make none of those either. And so I just, that was it. Okay, guys, give a hand clap for media. That's the, I got a couple more later. All right. Now, let me, let me explain a little bit about, about, about why my daddy didn't move. You know, we, I mean, all I knew, all my reality was in my entire life that daddy didn't live with us. My daddy came every week, and he worked at Schaefer, drove the Schaefer beer truck, and he also drove a cab. Some of y'all, you know what I'm saying? Oh, Schaefer, I remember that. Mm. Yeah, and, uh, and so my daddy came, and I, you know, there's certain things when you're young you can just remember about, I can, I can remember how he smelled, I remember the tree air fresheners in the car, he drove a Plymouth Fury, you know. I remember all that stuff, love my daddy, you know. But my reality growing up for a father figure wasn't like everybody else's. When I got older, I realized it was different. I realized that some daddies lived at the house, but when you're little and you're growing up, you just kind of, so things, as I got older, mommy began to explain things to me, that daddy had another family. Daddy was married. And so my daddy, I know everybody's quiet, don't come on, no, don't worry, come on, pep it up, y'all, I'm just giving you my story, all right, I'm good. And so daddy was married and he had a whole nother family and he kept promising, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna live with you guys, I'm coming to stay with you, but daddy never really came. And so there's things that transpired in my life that people would define as, well, he didn't have a father. Had he had a father, some of these things wouldn't be happening. Now last year I taught a message, I can't think of the title of what it was, it was on a Sunday. Um, and I gave you a lot of my life and I was a bad kid. Oh God, in heaven, I was bad. When I was in elementary school, some of y'all remember the story, uh, I, I had to see a psychologist. Yeah, yeah, now I was, I was, when I say bad, y'all, I was, I, was, I was that one that, my wife said if they had written it out at that time, you'd have had a couple of them in your mouth, you know, because I wasn't the well, most well-behaved. I mean, one incident I remember, man, 
slamming doors in elementary school. Now I'm in second grade. And me and this other kid at lunch, we planned on leaving class early so we could, you know, slam doors. The doors open to the outside. So we run around, bam, <laughs> bam, slamming doors, bam. So we did that a couple times, you know. And so I remember him saying, I'm going back to class before I get in trouble. I said, I'm going to keep doing it. Because I said, I'm having fun by myself doing this, man, <laughs> slamming doors. So one particular day, I'm slamming the doors, bam. I ran, hit that staircase. <laughs> on that second step was Miss Ruth. Now, y'all ever see Casper the ghost? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you know how when they see him, they go, oh, ghost! And the, and, the, and, the, and the spirit just leave the body. That's what happened at that time, boy. Man, she snatched my tail up, took me back to the class, swung that door open. Of course, everything stopped. And she said, now, you sit your black behind down here. If I have to come back here and get caught from school because you're here, I'm going to beat your black <laughs> donkey. She said the word. That's what she said. I sat and cried. I <laughs> my head down the whole rest of the class, man. They'd pull me out of class, and I'd go see a, a psychologist, and he'd show me them ink pictures, you know. John, what do this look like? <laughs> I got to tell him, man, it looked like a knife. <laughs> <laughs> that one looked like matches. <laughs> what did it look like? That looked like the school. <laughs> I, I, you, know, I, you know, just, just I, you know, John, do you want to play with any toys back here, the fire truck? Dad, are, are you upset because you don't have a daddy at the home? And he's asking me these questions. And now it's being built into me that you're here because you probably, you don't have a father. And so they're reestablishing that into me. And here's another thing, man. I mean, my mama had done everything that she could, but they're telling her that if, if, if his father was here, but we can work that out. Because, you know, plenty of kids has got this going on, so we, could, we can help with this, you know? And so, I mean, my, to the point, my mama had the, the assistant principal beating me at school. Yeah, man, I don't, y'all probably never had that. It can't happen today. But I remember being in the office. I can still see today. She had on that blue dress, white polka dots, and a big white earring, clip on earring. She called my mama and said, uh-huh, yeah, he's down here again, child. Uh-huh. So what happened on the stories? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> You, I know you lying. Oh, girl, uh-huh. Okay, I will, I will. She told me to beat you. <laughs> Put that earring back in her ear, turn me over, and whip my tail right there in her office, man. Yes, sir. So I had some issues. So we decided to move to Maryland. My mother, she wanted to get us out of Maryland because she said, you know, if I don't get this boy out of Maryland and do something, he could end up dead and all this other stuff. So I told her, I said, you don't know that that, that would have happened. I could have been a rapper. I don't know what anything could have happened, man. But, <laughs> but she said he going to end up dead, you know. So, so we came to Maryland. The very first day we was in Maryland, very first day, uh, we lived in an apartment complex in Rockville, had a high rise. I went in with the other kids who were, and I pulled the fire alarm in the high rise. Just see if people run out. Yeah. I know. Some of y'all looking like, yeah, this wasn't yesterday, all right? Some of y'all looking like, Jesus Christ. Some of y'all like, God can do anything. Look at him, Lord. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. I, I pulled the fire alarm, ran. And I thought nobody saw me, but the, the maintenance man and another kid saw, came to the door, and we were staying with another family. And they said, there he is. He did it, you know? And so they begging and apologizing on stuff. Went to the back room. I still remember that black belt. And boy, she tore my tail up, man. So, you know, I had things, spots, and here's the thing. You get to elementary school, uh, you don't have a father, you know, so these are some of the things that happen, and this is what happens when, you know. But so we, we got some things that can help. I become a teenager. I get tired of my mom and Doris. I'm just upset because we had a big blowout one night, and I'm, I'm running away. I'm getting out of here, man. So I don't know where to go. Long story short, I end up at the Glenmont Police Station. And they said, well, here's what we need to do. We need to, uh, we need to get him involved in something. So I, I'm talking to a white police officer, but he, feel, he felt like he couldn't relate to me so that he got a black detective to come over and talk to me. His name was John Boston. He said, what's up, brother? How you doing? I ain't nowhere to stay. I need somewhere to stay. He says, well, we, we can't have nowhere for you to stay. We can work this out. Why don't we do this? Let's call your mom. I said, oh, no, we can't do that. I can't go back there and sleep tonight for some of the things I said, you know. Now, now we got to get home. So he called my mama, and we went home. And boy, boy, the look on her face, man. But John was a smooth dude, man. He talked to her, 
And, uh, you know, look on my mama's face, man, she looked like she kind of liked John a little bit. I was, you know, <laughs> you won't be his daddy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I thought she might have said, said something like that, you know. He was smooth dude, you know. But anyway, uh, <laughs> they said, let's get him in a counselor. You know, so every Monday night, we down in Silver Spring, counseling. So everybody's talking to me. So they said, you know what? He doesn't have a father. He's not getting out of the neighborhood. Let's get him in this group. And we'll put him in this group, and this group will kind of help him, you know, kind of come along and, you know, get, get outside the neighborhood and that kind of thing, man. So, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be in no, in no group, you know, but now nah, you need to go to the group, they're going to take you camping, they're going to take you cave and all this other stuff. I, I'm from New York, I don't want to do all that, you know, so caving, you know, yeah, I understand. My, my total knowledge base was my house, my neighborhood, I did the schoolwork to pass the test and what was on TV. So when you talk about cave, I'm thinking Yogi and Boo Boo Bear. <laughs> I don't know nothing about no caving, but anyway, come, bring the list to my mother and say, Ma, here's the stuff that I'm gonna need. They say, I'm gonna I'm need a sleeping bag, I'm gonna need uh, some boots, because we're going hiking out somewhere, Harper's Ferry, and I'm gonna need, you know, I'm gonna need a canteen, you know, because we got water and we got to eat and stuff like that. She said, well, first of all, I ain't got no sleeping bag and I ain't buying one, so you go take them blankets and them sheets, <laughs> You're going to wear them shoes on your feet. And then I hear, I got some Tupperware. You remember Tupperware? <laughs> I had Tupperware. You know the bowl with the, the plastic white top and stuff and the little, the remember the tall skinny cup? Yeah. Remember the white, how many of y'all remember Tupperware the, with the cap on it and stuff like that? I had to take that. So here's this group that I'm in that's supposed to help me because why? I don't have no. So I'm in this group. I'm the only black guy in it. And so the guy, Charlie, who was ahead of it, said, John, come meet, come meet everybody. This is Jimmy. What's up, dude? Christine, what's up? What's up? You know, uh, all the guys and the girls in the group was nothing. Nobody listened to R&B. All DC 101, if you're from DC, remember that? The rock station, ACDC jackets and Kiss, you know, smoking Marlboro cigarettes. And they said, hey, man, you smoke? Nah, come on, dude, try one, man. I don't want to smoke. Come on, man, come on, John. <laughs> Trying to fit in. So now I'm pushed into this group because I ain't have no. So I'm in this group and they said we're gonna go cave in, we're gonna do all this stuff. So I went one trip and went to another trip, and y'all cave in is not what you think it is. We went in somewhere, I know it was illegal. You, we, they moved the board and, and we climbed down underground into something. I'm like, this ain't this ain't a this ain't no um no cave that I know of. Don't, not on the Flintstones, they don't do this. And so you, we had on the, the helmet with the kerosene fire and still have a light. You walk in in all this mud, and I mean, you crawl in spaces, low as that chair, no top, and mud in your face, and just, it was, it was, it was, it was bad. And here I am, <laughs> this little black boy from New York, in a cave. And that second time was scary, because I hated being there. So you're in there for about four hours from one end all the way to, to, the, to the next end, you know. And I'm in here because I'm being made to do it because, you know, I got problems, Steve. I got issues. So caving's supposed to solve that, you know. So they stopped. Water break! Everybody stopped. Well, you know what they did. They all took off their little canteens, <laughs> put on their hair, said, woo! Woo! John, John Water! Well, you know what I pulled out. Put, put it on back in my little, John, drink some more water, John, you don't want to water. Nah, I'm, I'm full, <laughs> you know, I don't want to water. So just, just emotionally, I'm in there. So we're, this one particular case, the guy, we're, we got tied ropes around us and we go through some, some area where it was about this much space and it was this big, dark nothing, you couldn't see it. And we were roped together and we're, come on, everybody take your time, get across. Something happened up ahead and I heard, Christine screamed, oh my God, Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. Charlie fell. And then it got real. Everybody, everybody relax, get across, get across, get across. I'm thinking, in the name of Jesus. So I get across and we sit down. I said, if I could get out here by myself, I'd be out of here, man, you know? So it take about 40 something minutes. We had to rope something and, and get down and get Charlie. The guy got Charlie out, Charlie kind of injured. And then we get out, I'm covered, bud from head to toe. And now, now, now we're going to the, to, the, to the river, 
and we're going to do inner tubing on the river. I don't, how many of y'all know, you know? Jimmy, give me a cigarette. <coughs> I need something. <laughs> you know? What am I doing in this? So as I'm going along, everybody kept pointing back to you didn't have a father. So now I'm getting older, and that's all that's embedded in me that there's things not right in my life because something in my past is evidently affecting my future. Now, how many of y'all know there's plenty of kids that have done some stuff and they had both parents in the house? And so it wasn't necessarily probably that, but that was the diagnosis. And then here's because we knew no better, we had to accept that. We didn't have to, but that's all, we, that's all they gave us. They just said, because you don't have this and your past was jacked up, it's a result of what's going on. Now, sometimes that can be true. But I don't think that's true for every case, especially for not the believer. And we were saved, but when you don't have any knowledge of something, you just walk with what you're told. And so now I'm going to becoming a father. I, I'm, get, you know, I'm getting married. I, I had a son before I got married. My wife had a daughter, and we're getting married. And, got a father. and I'm concerned because I don't have a model of what a father is supposed to be. What's, what's a true model? Because I'm looking for something that evidently they've told me all my life I didn't have. So now I'm asking you, where are you today? It might not even be a father. What has somebody told you that you're missing and you accepted it and your life's in a place right now because you just accepted that? And it's very subtle. Sometimes we're looking for the devil to be growling and smoke and moving furniture and cutting off lights and all that stuff. But it's a, it could be a subtle deception to turn you away from what you really are, what you really have, towards something else. And then you live your life in a pattern thinking that you don't have enough. And I'm thinking, I got to fix this because I got kids. So the only thing I could do at 19, I remember saying, I really don't care for my dad that much, so I still had to point back to the past and say, here's what I'm not going to be. Here's what is not going to happen to me. Now, some of y'all may think that is good, but I'll show you maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, okay? So now, let's go through the Bible. Y'all ready? You got the Bibles? Let's go to Acts chapter 6. Let's get an example here. You guys with me so far? All right, I got a few minutes to finish this. We're going to do it. <clears throat> Acts chapter 6. No, I think it's 6. Yeah, Acts chapter 6. Now, I'm going to start at verse 5, but let me give you an account of what's going on here. There's some strife going on here within the church. You know, the uh, Greek-speaking Jews are fighting with the Hebrew-speaking Jews because they're, the widows wouldn't be taken care of. So it, it, it almost, if I had to give an, exam, an illustration of how it was running, let's just say uh, Charles is a Greek-speaking Jew. Okay, okay, but then Leo is a Hebrew-speaking Jew. So when Charles is serving, you notice all the people that's with him, they get more food. They get more benefits. And then Leo, no, he said, wait a minute. How come every time you serve, all your folks getting a little bit more and mine ain't? I mean, when Leo serves, it's vice versa. So they got a little strife going on. They go to the apostles and they say, hey, listen, we need to fix this. You guys come out here because there's too much strife, too much going on. And the apostles said, man, we're not doing this. We are not going to leave the word of God to fix this. Here's what you're going to do. Look among yourselves. You find yourself seven men that full of wisdom, good report, and all that stuff, and you bring them to us, we'll anoint them, and they're, and they're going to be over you guys to handle this nonsense that's going on. That's, 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 a, that's how we got deacons here. We let you all pick them so that we don't have to always take time away from the word of God to handle the other things that we need to be focused on God. Amen? Acts 6-5. Uh, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, who they set before the apostles, and when he had prayed and they laid their hands on them, the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Just side note here, notice how if you get rid of strife, there's increase coming. Just, just a little, little, little note to, if you're leading anything, your household, you give it a strife, great increase comes. Amen? This is in a great company of the priests who are obedient up to the faith. And Stephen, one guy's about to stand out here, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. 
Then there arose a, uh, a certain of the synagogues, which was called the synagogue of the Lip Lipertines, Syrians, the Alexandrians, the and uh, them of Sicilia, Sicilia, excuse me, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit which he spake. Stephen was a bad boy. So as, they, as they're arguing with him about scripture, Stephen is just going, I mean, he's handling his business, and they can't stand him. And so sometimes you could be right in church, and people still will be in their own traditions, and so they, they can't stand him. So they try to set him up, and they bring him to the chief priest and say, he, he's going to defy the laws of Moses. He's trying to take Jesus' stuff over Moses' stuff, and they bring him to the chief priest. And let's go to chapter 7, verse 54, and I'll start reading. I'll put it on the screens. And when they heard these things, the things that Stephen was preaching, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So powerful, because we know Jesus is seated. So now he's standing up. Something's about to happen. He knows that Stephen's probably about to lose his life. He's about to welcome him. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him in the wilderness. And, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Everybody say Saul. Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin on their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So now here's you guys kind of see what's going on here. They got so angry at this God. It's like, oh, kill him. Oh, my God. Hold my, hold my coat. Hold my coat. So I got I to give me a yell. Y'all kill him. Kill him. And, and Saul took their coats, held their coats for them while he's going forth and getting, and getting stoned. Now, I'm going to read into chapter 8, but I'm going to read another version. I'm going to read you the Amplified, the Classic Edition, all right? Acts 8, verse 1 says, And Saul was not only consenting to Stephen's death, he was pleased and entirely approving. On that day, a great and severe persecution broke out against the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Everybody broke camp. When they saw all this happening, they was like, man, we get out of here. These, these, these dudes is real. <laughs> and they took off, and they, and they left them by themselves. A party of devout men with, uh, with others helped to carry out and bury Stephen and made a great lamentation over him, but Saul, Watch this. Shamefully treated and laid waste the church continuously. Here's how he did it, everybody. With cruelty and with violence. And entering into house after house and dragging out men and women and committing them to prison. Saul was evil. I mean, he's because of what you believe, and you don't believe what I believe spiritually, he's busting in people's houses, dragging them up with violence and with cruelty. Ladies and gentlemen, that's like a terrorist. He really believes what I believe. He believes you guys are, are, are disobeying Mosaic law. He says, and you need to die for this. Now, this is Saul doing this, and he, he really thinks what he is doing is right. And there are some things that we have done in our past that we really believe was right. Some of you might have parents that did some things that they thought was right. They thought this was okay. Or I didn't know nobody. This is how it's supposed to happen. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is how I'm supposed to discipline you. This is how my mama did it. This is how my daddy did it. This is how this is what's supposed to happen to you. And he just believed this is what's supposed to go on. All right, let's continue. Verse 4. Now those who were scattered abroad went about through the land from place to place, preaching the glad tidings, the word, the doctrine concerning the attainment through Christ of salvation in the kingdom of God. Now Philip... The deacon, not the apostle, went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed uh, the Christ to them, the people. And great crowds of people with one accord listened to and heeded what was said by Philip. And as they heard him and watched the miracles and wonders which kept performing from time to time. So, so Philip is kind of walking in that anointing that Stephen had now. Now he is the man and he's evangelizing and supernatural things are taking place. Verse 7 says, for foul spirits came out of many who was possessed by them, screaming and shouting with a loud voice, and many who were suffering with palsy or, or crippled were restored to health. And there was a great rejoicing in the city. Now, our boy is gone, but we still got to keep going on, and our boy is gone because of Saul and his crew. 
Now, you guys know Acts chapter 9, if you go back and read it, you know, he goes and gets permission to go get people and kill them just in the name of, you know, what's, what's, what he thinks is right. Well, he encounters Jesus. And Jesus knocks him off his horse. And now he, you know, Jesus said, listen, why are you persecuting me? He said, I ain't persecuting you. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Y'all know that, that account, right? You know? And so he gets converted and he gets changed. And now uh, Jesus says, I want you to go to Ananias. I got somebody coming to you. And Ananias said, man, don't, wait a minute. I heard about this dude. Don't send this dude to my house. He said, nah, nah, he's going to be good. But now, how many know Ananias got to really walk by faith? Because yes. if this dude is cruel, doing stuff with violence, now nah, I, I got to pray. And so, you know, he probably did it with trepidation like we would. Walk him in the house and he's blind, but still. I don't know what's going to happen when you open your eyes and can see. So, so now, but now everybody's got to work on this forgiveness thing here. Now, you know who, you know who probably wasn't rejoicing? How many of y'all, I mean, I read, I, read, I read the New Testament. Two-thirds of the New Testament was written by Paul, who was Saul. And nice Paul. How many of y'all blessed by Romans 10? Thank you. I found out. Just lift your hands. If I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, yes, amen. Thank you, Paul. First Corinthians. Chapter 13, the love chapter. I helped work some things out in my life. Th everybody say, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Yes, 2 Corinthians 9. He said, listen, don't be stingy. Listen, man, you got to give. Don't, don't. No. Thank, thank you, Paul. Galatians, I can go on. You know, whatever man sows, that's what it, th Thank you. Thank you, Paul. You know who probably wasn't thanking Paul? Stephen's family. His boys, the other seven, the other six that were left, they probably wasn't thanking him. Because some people still look back to the past, and that's how they measure you. But the first person that has to realize that they're changed in this situation has to be Paul. He cannot continue to look back at his life and say, okay, I can't move forward. I can't do this. Why? Because I was killing people. I was dragging them out with violence. Paul has to believe that he was transformed and he was changed, or he's not going to fulfill the will of God, and he can't even go on with his life. And I'm asking you right now, can you still go on regardless of what happened to you? Or are you still stuck back with somebody did, somebody said, what they diagnosed you to be, and now you're living with this in your life, and you're struggling in areas? Tell your neighbor, I'm free. Yeah, you gotta be, you gotta be free. You got, you gotta, you gotta first get it, and he has to get it. Now let's, let me show you something here. Let's go down to, oh boy, I like to read this account. Acts chapter twenty-one. I'm gonna show you Paul's example of how free he was. Acts twenty-one, verse seven. I'm not gonna be long. I got four minutes. We can do it. <clears throat> Acts twenty-one seven. It says, and when he had finished, our, and when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus, and saluted the brethren and abode with them for one day. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came to, came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and watch this, and we abode with him. How in the world can you be the one involved in killing my boy and you can come stay at my house? Something supernatural has to happen here. But even more so, how in the world can Paul lay down and go to sleep in that man's house after some years ago, he was terrorizing him and he killed his boy. Now, I, I, now you just heard me tell my story about my mama, right? I didn't even want to go home that night for some of the things I said to my mama when that police officer brought me home. I slept with the door closed against the wall Hugging myself, waking up, because I said, she's going to come in here and smother me. I know she's just tricking that police officer, man. I said, how do you go and do that? Something other than just, oh, I, I, I'm going to forget my past, I'm going to forget my past. Something other than that has to happen to me. And that he recognized that account he had with Jesus set him free. Totally free, where he doesn't have to look at his past, he doesn't have to identify with his past. I mean, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, uh, if you be in Christ, you are a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, what? All things are become new. Paul has to believe that. I have to believe that. So regardless of 
My daddy and where he was, what he did, what he didn't do, lying to us, constantly lying, I have to get myself free from that and say, it's not going to affect my future. It's not going to affect my children. I am not going to repeat. The curse is repeated because people don't renew their minds, not because there's something spiritually in them. So you're free from the curse. So it's not we got a generational curse and a, when the men don't stay around and this happens and they do. That is not true. It's just a teaching of the mindset. Amen. If that was the case, then you can never be free. What's the point? Amen. But now we have to allow Christ to come in and uproot some of that foolishness, some of the stuff that we thought was true, some of the things. I don't care what's going on. You might be a mama here. And my mama hit that baby daddy's not coming. Who cares about that right now? Where are we going? Yes, he should pay his child support, all that stuff. But if you're trying to pull something from him that he might not have, you let Jesus do the work. Amen. You can't fix that yourself, and you might not be called to fix that. If you were daddy, you made some mistakes, and you're sitting in here, and you're regretting the things you've done, and you're hurt by it. He said, oh, I can't be this. I was this. They won't set me. But no, you get free. If you're in Christ, everybody has made some kind of mistake. And I'm not talking about way before. Some of y'all made some mistakes in the parking lot. It's the past. You get free. No, it ain't the past. They cussed me out, Elder John. It's the past. <laughs> and you're free. But we still live in our past sometimes. And we can't continue to live in our past no matter how bad it hurt, no matter you know, what somebody said or what they diagnosed you with. Listen, you are free. And you got to let Christ work on that to renew your mind. Everything is under the bridge. This is Philippians chapter 3. This is the Amplified. This is, this is what helped me. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I do not count that I have made it, my own, made it on my own yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Watch what he said. Paul said this now, and this is the man who could testify to this. I press on toward the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what I do, I got to forget what happened behind and I got to look forward to what God's trying to do right now in my life and press for. He's got a prize for me. He's got a prize for me to be a good father. Amen. And so now I had to even get rid of I'm not going to do this so I don't be like him because I'm still focused on the past. And that's what happens sometimes. We'll say, I'm not going to do this because this happened. This. I'm not. And so we're still looking back. We're still looking back. We're still looking at the negative. No, forget all that. I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm a new man. And now you're going to show me how to be a good father. Amen. You're going to show me. I might not have had that model, but I've got you, Jesus. Amen. Now, here's the, here's the thing that we might not realize in, 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 in all of this. Remember I shared with you the scripture? In Genesis chapter 28, and Jacob said, God was here, and I didn't even know it. Who's got my list, Sean? Yes. Name the first thing on that list. Protector. That was my mama. Second thing. Provider. That was my mama. That was my aunties, my uncles, neighbors. Next thing. A male figure. A male figure. I had different men that came in my life and helped me. Even as an adult, I got men that come around and help me renew my mind to what it is to be a man and to be a father. Next one. Strong. Strong. I got a lot of strength from my mama. I had this young lady that I worked with in LB Cherry. She was strong. When you shake a man's hand, you look in their face. What, what's on that shirt? I don't know if it's black or white. I just like the way it looks. Don't you ever wear no shirt that you can't explain what it means in the words. I, we got another one? Leader. Leader. Learn leadership from Pastor Bruinton, Pastor Kit. Learn how to be strong from Pastor Kit. You a man. You stay, no, no, you don't do that. I don't have, you know, me and Karen had, you, I, hey, 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 I want to hear that. You a man. Oh, Lord. Yeah, if y'all ever worked with Pastor Kit, she was, she was straightforward, you know. I'm saying, with Pastor Kit, I didn't do this. And we were standing in here, and I'm going, this to happen, and then this. I don't want to hear that. You're a leader. You take responsibility. I don't care who did what. It might not be your fault, but it's still your responsibility. Amen. Learn that from her. Amen. Listen to scripture. I'm going to show you something. Psalm 68, 5 says, The father, this is God, of the fatherless, and a judge and a protector of the widows, is God in his holy habitation. 
I found that when I go back and have supernatural recall and hindsight, that God was manifesting himself as father through a whole bunch of other areas in my life. But I had other people telling me, because you don't have one, you're missing this. And so I'm confessing it. My mama's confessing it. Everybody's confessing this is what's going on. Had somebody said, open your heart to God and say, look, there's a father right here in this. There's a father right here. So God was present, and I didn't even know it. Now, I want you to think about your life. Was God present in whatever you were dealing with, whatever you're holding on to, whatever was happening to you, and you didn't even recognize it? If he said he would never leave me and forsake me, then I have to believe Amen. that somehow he's going to get me what I need to get. Amen. Regardless of what anybody says, regardless of what I don't see in the natural. Amen. So I'm telling you all here today, and I'm done, that I don't care what you got going on, what's happened, what your baby daddy didn't do, what you didn't do as a father, whatever. You might not have had a daddy in your life, but you've always had a father in your life. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Do you hear what I'm telling you? So, everybody, eyes closed, eyes closed. Let's pray. I know that there's some things that God said to some people in here today. I know it. Regardless of where you are in your past and what you got going on in your past, what took place in your past or what didn't take place in your past, and you're feeling it. But God said he could set you free. And this is a day of salvation, a day to just get free. Father's Day means many different things. Some, some daddies have gone on to heaven. Doesn't mean God left you. Your daddy might not have been in your life. You might not even know your daddy. You could be a, a product of, 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 of sexual assault, and you're here, and you're feeling, I don't have something. Yes, you do. You've got God, and he's here to love you. And so just want to get free. Don't, everybody's eyes are closed. If you just want to be free, lift your hand. Just, you know, something in my past, something's going on that I want to get free. It doesn't have to be your daddy. It could be anything. I'm going to lift your hand, and I want to pray. We don't have to come to have an altar call for it. I see your hand over here to my left, in front. Okay, okay. Everybody stand. Let's stand. Let's stand. I'm not going to do an altar call for that. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pray for those who lifted their hands. Come on, you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, and that's the best way we can enter into to, to something supernatural, just begin to pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, we love you so much. <clears throat> and if you're in here and you're dealing, your emotions are up because, Lord, I just want to get free of this in my past. They labeled me. Come on, just turn it over to Jesus. Father, I just pray right now you release them. Manifest your love, manifest your goodness. Be strong in their life, O oh Lord. Let them see all the areas that you manifested, you, you want to manifest in. Show them, Lord, that you're good. Show them that you're good. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Does everybody say it again? I'm free. I'm free from my past. I press forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me show you something. Guys, you got the last two slides. Show me the, the first, let me show you the first slide and give you a testimony. That's my family now. <laughs> just, just, just beautiful. Now listen, we ain't perfect. I'm not even gonna stand here and tell you we perfect. But here's what I do know. I appreciate how God has got me to a place where I didn't repeat a cycle. And I tried to minister to my dad. I've tried several times to get in touch with him, but I stopped looking at what had happened to me. And I pressed forward to what I knew God wanted for me, and that picture was it. Second slide. That's the sec this next picture here is just us at dinner. Um, the last one. That's us right there. Uh, we, we were celebrating my uh, oldest daughter. She is a teacher. She was teaching here in D.C. And she just stepped out on faith and said, I'm moving to Miami. And so we, she, we had dinner at, that night, and we went out. And let me give you just a quick testimony. Her, her, her biological father and I fought physically. I'm talking about not wrestle. We fought, got down, fighting, physically fighting twice. Once in Karen's living room, breaking up stuff. And, and it wasn't because of Karen. No, it wasn't like Karen broke a pool stick and said, hey, y'all gonna fight my love and threw it in the middle. That, that, that didn't happen, <laughs> okay? It's just, we was just ignorant. 
and we, and we fought. I have been at two events here in Montgomery County where, they, you know, they put the preachers in the pulpit. He is an ordained minister of the gospel, and I'm an ordained minister of the gospel. Mm -hmm. You hear me? And, and I would preach the funeral. He was right behind me, amen, and everything else. Only God could do that. Yes. Only God could do that. And see, that's the little extra tidbit you get when you focus on, I just want you, Jesus. I want to do what's right. Forget about the past. He forgot about his past. Wonderful family. We just, you know, I mean, we don't all have Thanksgiving dinner together. But we see each other. We, I mean, I said, God, only you could do, I'm preaching this funeral. I'm like, only you could do this. Me and him are in the pulpit together as ministers. Yeah. Only God, only God could do that. So I'm here to tell you, forget about your past. Let those pains go. You're the only one that can hold on to that stuff. You let it go and you press forward. Amen.